I have the joy of starting a new series this morning called Pressure Points, when, Where the Bible Meets Life. Many of you know that uh, my job entails a lot of counseling, in fact, more so and more so. Uh, I spend a lot of hours in the counseling room with people who are going through hard and challenging times in their life. Uh, I sometimes am asked, how, how do you put up with that, all these problems that you hear about day after day after day? And I say to them, well, you know, I just every morning when I wake up, I say, God, uh, I look at my schedule and I say, God, I don't know what I'm going to face today in my office. But I know for sure that there's going to be people there who have what I call sinkholes in their life. People who are going through very deep and dark times in their life. And they have trusted me with their problems because they're looking for a way through that. And so we're going to be talking about that this morning, but let me just quickly give you a preview of what's coming the, the next three weeks, uh, starting today. Uh, we'll talk about the sinkholes in just a minute. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about uh, a subject called 70 Grams of Power. Uh, I like putting snazzy titles on them. Uh, usually what follows isn't quite as snazzy, but we're going to be talking about the tongue, because James uh, chooses, out of all the subjects he could have chosen, he chooses to address both the pros and the cons of this little 70 ounce muscle, or 70 gram muscle, 70 ounces would be pretty big, wouldn't it? And uh, he, uh, he talks about that. So next week, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. And then the third week, we're going to go to James chapter 5, where we're going to be talking about, does God still heal people? I get asked that question a lot. Does God still heal people, or is that just for the Bible days? And so we're going to address that subject here in, in two more weeks. So today, we, if you have your Bibles or your phone and you'd like to turn to James chapter 1, we're going to be just reading a, a passage of Scripture there, and that will uh, form the foundation for what we want to say this morning. Um, I'm going to be reading, I don't often read from the Living Bible, but um, Eugene Peterson says it so well and kind of comes at it from the same perspective in his translation uh, as to what I want to say here this morning. Uh, the scripture will be up on the screen. I'm going to add uh, one more verse at the end that won't be on the screen. Uh, that was just an oversight on my part. So James chapter 1, we'll start reading from uh, verse 2. Dear brothers, is your life full of difficulties and temptations? Then be happy, for when the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. So let it grow. And don't try to squirm out of your problems. For when your patience is fully in bloom, then you will be ready for anything, strong in character, full and complete. If you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him, and he will gladly tell you, for he is always ready to give a bountiful supply of wisdom to all who ask him. He will not resent it. But when you ask him, be sure that you really expect him to tell you, for a doubtful mind will be as unsettled as the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And every decision you then make will be uncertain. And you then make, and what you make will be uncertain. And as you turn first this way and that, if you don't ask with faith, don't expect the Lord to give you any solid answer. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive a crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I'm sure many of you have been following the news in the last couple of weeks, and you heard about a story that took place up at the Crowfoot Sea Train Station, where they're in the parking lot. I was driving into town early one morning, and I heard that there was a sinkhole up at the C train station in Crowfoot. And there was quite a, quite a bit of chatter on the uh, drive-in shows and things like that. They were all talking about this huge sinkhole that was making it impossible for three cars that had been parked over top of it to, to move away. And uh, I had earlier you know, in the summer asked God as I was preparing for this message to give me a metaphor of what, would, what it would be like for people who are going through hard times in their life. And the metaphor that the Lord brought to my attention was a sinkhole. And uh, I thought, well, that's a, that's a good picture of it. 
Because a sinkhole is, is kind of like problems in our life. If you can imagine it, you know that that sinkhole at one time is covered with cement or with, with uh, all kinds of things. You can see this one here. I had Wendy, my capable assistant, uh, go online and look for the best sinkhole she could find. Uh, this one is from China, and uh, they say that China holds the record for most sinkholes. Uh, I think Calgary may be close second, I'm not sure, but uh, I, I was looking at this picture earlier this week, and I thought, the person living in that little shack there on the edge better not be a sleepwalker. Uh, there could be some problems for that person. But as I thought about the sinkhole, I thought, yeah, that's what it's like for people. That's what it's like for you and me when big problems, overwhelming problems come into our life. I thought I'd just go to the most boring definition I could find, and this is what the dictionary says. A sinkhole is a hollow depression underground that is caused by rapid or gradual corrosion, leaving an unusable and unstable cavity or a large hole. It's kind of boring, but it says it, doesn't it? And that's the way I think it is with life, with a lot of us. We may be going along in life and everything looks great. Everything on us, under us is solid and we think life could not be better. And then mysteriously and sometimes shockingly, God brings big problems into our life. A few years ago, uh, in my early ministry days, I had a lady that phoned the, the church office and she said, uh, Larry, can I come in and talk to you? Uh, I'm living through a hell right now. So I said, come on in. And so she came in and I was kind of shocked because I was sitting in my chair and waiting for her to come and sit in her chair. And she walked over to the window and she began to curse God with a long string of really harsh expletives and crude talk. And then she changed from there to outright profanity, cursing the name of God. Well, that morning I didn't really expect that when I came into my office. And then she turned around and she said, Well, Pastor, I bet that hurt your holy ears. And I said, Well, no, I used to work with construction people, so I have heard those words before. But the only thing about it that is hurtful is you're talking about my very best friend. But you know what? Don't worry about it. At least you're talking to him. And you know what else? He hears those words once or twice or maybe more every day. And so it's way more important that you came to talk to me about your problem because now I know that you are in a sinkhole, that you have hit rock bottom but God gives us instructions as to how we should handle that. And then I turned her to James chapter 1. I talked to her about the fact that when we look at the Bible, there's actually countercultural thinking as to how we're supposed to deal with problems. I've just come through an extensive degree program in counseling. And there we learned hour after hour as to how we help people think better of themselves and address their issues and kind of accept the fact that life isn't fair and all of those things. But I would sit in those classes and I'd go, hmm, Scripture has some bitter medicine that all of us have to look at and, and understand because the writer of James comes at it from a completely different perspective when he says, my brothers, my dear brothers and sisters, when problems come into your life, Consider it, I like the way the NIV puts it, consider it pure joy. Now let me ask you, I ask myself this question all week long. Do I consider it pure joy when I drop into a sinkhole of life? No, usually I come to God and I say, God, where are you? Why have you stepped away from my life and left me looking up to even see the light? Even in my job now, and I love my job of counseling, because it gives me an opportunity for me to turn people who are going through deep, dark waters to a Savior who really cares, and I really believe that. I have people that come in every week dealing with a myriad of questions and problems. Some of them are emotional, people dealing with depression or anxiety, Others are relational, marriages that have gone sideways, people that are fighting like cats and dogs. Or financial, 
people that have maxed out their credit cards and now they're saying to me, Larry, what should I do? Or they're declaring bankruptcy because things didn't go well in a business. And then people come to me with spiritual problems saying, I feel so dry. I feel like my spiritual life is a desert. God seems distant and I've quit talking to him. Then there's people that come with physical problems. Uh, I'm going to refer to two of our families here a little later on. But people that come and say, Larry, we just received the bad news that we have terminal cancer. And the doctors are giving us a certain amount of time that we need to prepare for the worst. The list goes on. But one thing I have learned in my almost 40 years of ministry now is that none of us are exempted, exempt, I guess that's the word, from sinkholes in our life. At times, God chooses and allows us to, bring, to come into times where we have sinkholes in our life. What is the takeaway from our, our passage here this morning that we just read? Well, I would kind of boil it down to this. God brings us trials and challenges in life, period. These sinkholes are designed not for our bad or for, to make God look as if he's uh, trying to treat us cruelly, but for our good. But it all depends on how we look at them. God wants us to embrace them with joy and through that grow into mature people. None of us can avoid these problems or challenges in life. It's part of being human. But more than that, we need to realize that sinkholes can be good things. Instead of looking at these things as being negatives, we can say, God, my life is totally in your hands, and you bring those things into my life, both the good and the bad, for my own good and well-being. But as I look at people going through sinkholes in their life, I can see that there are several ways that we as humans naturally or spontaneously respond to them. The first thing would be that people who are looking at things actually react. They will say things like this, where is God in all of this and why is he letting this happen to me? Why is he so absent when right now I need him more than I've ever needed him before? I had someone not long ago come into my office, a non-believer, and they said to me, is your God powerful, Larry? I said, he sure is. Well, I got a big problem. Can he fix me? And I said, oh, I believe he can. And then he said to me, well, the bigger question is, can you fix me? And I said, no, I can't guarantee that. But that's often how we react when great big tidal waves have a tendency to come into our life and sideswipe uh, uh, side us when we're not expecting it. So the first thing is we react. We get angry. We say to God, please, just do something. I can't handle what you're putting me through. The second kind of response that we often th see is that we, re we retreat. We actually do just the office, opposite. We become very passive and we say, well, I might as well just curl up in the fetal position and let life go by because there's no hope for me. And we cut off our relationships with God and even with other people who are close to us. And we go into kind of a funk for a while, trying to work out why this darkness has surrounded us and made us go into a sinkhole. And so the first two human re um, responses are kind of that old psychology 101, fight or flight. We come out fighting God, saying, God, why are you doing this? I'm angry. I'm completely angry that you're letting this happen. Or just the opposite, we withdraw in quietness and kind of give up. But really, for the believer and for those who really believe that God does control our life, and is in charge of everything that comes our way, we really need to realize that God is there for us in everything that we do. God is there even when the absolutely most difficult problems come our way. And I don't think the writer of James was trying to be cynical or insensitive when he says, look at your problems and say, I'm going to put a petunia in my hat and be happy. No, He's saying that in the midst of all of that tension and turmoil and blackness, as you're looking up from that bottom of that sinkhole, there is some good. But we have to believe 
that God has not lost control of our lives. You see, if we are true believers in a God who is all-powerful, who created this incredible universe which is mind-blowingly beautiful, it is incredible to think that God has a plan for you and me. It doesn't mean that he kind of wound up a clock and he kind of plugged in on the computer of life some bad things and some good things and that he sits back indifferently and says, let's see how they squirm with that one. No, God says, I have a plan that is perfect and you can trust me completely for it. What is the perfect plan that God builds into the sinkholes of life? Well, I think it's quite strong here. It says it clearly. There's two main things that God wants to produce through our sinkholes. First of all, he wants us to build resilience, or in the other translation, they call it patience or perseverance, however you want to frame that. You see, if we didn't go through hard times in our life, I think it would be pretty easy to trust God, wouldn't it? It'd be real easy to trust God with our life because we would think, well, serving God only has positive benefits, and so all I need to do is put my life on cruise control, and God will make my life a bed of roses, to use an old cliche. But God says, no, no. I, I, I want to do a bigger work in you, and I'm going to bring some things into your life that may give you pain and darkness and sadness. But it's not because I love you any less or because I've walked away in an indifferent or passive way. It's because I want you to become tough people or strong people. I shared in another message not too long ago how uh, when I was going through seminary, I used to plant trees over in Regina for a landscaping company. And I used to always kind of feel sorry for these little spruce trees that we put in the ground, little tiny sticks, really. And I put them in the ground, and then during the middle of the winter, I'd think, those poor little suckers, they're standing out there in that 40 below zero weather, and the winds are whipping the life out of them. There's no way they're going to survive out there. But the following spring, I'd go back to some of those same homes that we worked on, and lo and behold, there's new buds and new life on those little trees, and I go, amazing. We used to call it hardening up the stock. That's what landscapers call it. If we take a tree that comes in from Vancouver, it's probably pretty feeble because it's only used to warm weather. And so we have to let it go through a winter, and sometimes they survive and sometimes they don't. And usually they do because part of the hardening process makes them tough. And I think that this is kind of a metaphor of what James is saying. God lets hard things come into our life, not because he wants us to be tough people in the sense of biker gang tough, but he wants us to be resilient so that as, as other problems come down the road, that we will be ready to say, God helped me in that time, I can take this one as well. The second thing that we see for the real purpose for God bringing that into our life and allowing us to go through sinkholes is that he wants to bring us into maturity. We see that in verses 3 and 4. A sad thing is to see a Christian that never grows up. And I, from time to time, see them. People that have maybe accepted the fact that God wants to have us accept salvation into our life, but we never allow God to do his work in our life. We never fully mature because we always play it safe. We say, every time I see a problem come, I'm going to take that into my own hands and I'm going to worm my way out of it. I like where, what uh, Eugene Peterson says at the beginning. Don't squirm out of the problems. Let God bring them into your life to bring about maturity. You know, I'm a grandfather many times over, and last night I was holding my newest little granddaughter, and uh, I sat there. I, I just never, ever stop marveling about the, the mystery and miracle of life. But I turned to my daughter and said, you know, it's really fun to have them at this stage for a while, but we don't want them to stay there. And she looked at me and she said, yeah, Dad, we do. We like them at this stage. And I said, but we want them to grow up. And she kind of reluctantly said, yeah, I guess so. But you know what? If we do not allow the sinkholes of life to produce the perfection, and I say we aim at perfection with God's help, but the perfection that God is wanting us to aspire to reach, we remain 
mature or we remain immature people as to what God really wants for our life. Yes, God brings us into painful situations in life so that we will become resilient and mature. Perhaps you're asking, well, so when we go through these problems, God just kind of steps back and says, believe that I'm doing good things and you're going to be tough and resilient and all of those things. But is that where it ends with God? No, we can see in the later verses there that God brings us resources. He draws close to us and says that I am there to help you during those times of need. He talks about this in five, verses 5 and 6. It says, if you want to know what God wants you to do, then ask him, and he will gladly tell you, for he is always ready to give a bountiful supply of wisdom to all who ask him. He will not resent it. I don't know about you, but that makes me almost a charismatic. I don't have to worry about these problems because I've got a God who is standing by and says, if you're feeling inadequate for all of the world dumping on you like it is, just turn to God and ask him, I don't know my way out, will you help me? And James says, and God isn't going to say, uh, 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 squirm time. He's saying no, he's not going to resent it. He is going to draw close to you and help you. But then it says in the latter part, this is the part that's a little bit harder to do, it says that he wants us to believe that he has our best interest in mind. It says it this way. He says, here I am for you, just ask, but don't ask with any question marks. I like that. Don't ask with any question marks because that means you really can't trust God with your life and more than that, with all of the problems he allows to come into your life. God wants us to be mature people. But the only way he can do that is to allow darkness at times to invade our life. Where the bottom drops out of life and we drop into the cavity or a sinkhole in life. You know, as I think about how we look at life and the shortness of life, I often say to God, God, help me not resist anything you want to bring into my life. Now, that's a dangerous prayer to pray because God will often do just that. But that doesn't mean we need to be superstitious or fear God's uh, wrath. We know that God is only a good God. But he wants us to say when those dark times come to us, God, I can't do this on my own. Will you please help me? The final point that this passage teaches us here this morning is that God wants his people to be part of his plan in the lives of other people. I like to call it Christian lighthouses. Now you can see this lighthouse that I brought along as a prop this morning. Uh, earlier in the year I said, Lord, I want to have something on my front lawn that will be something that will be a conversation piece for my neighbors. Every Christmas, my power bill goes up about a third when I, when I put up a, a pretty big display of Christmas lights. I always say that's my Christmas card to the community. And uh, I thought, but what can I do in the summer uh, that would kind of um, let people know that my house is a safe place to come and talk? They can talk over the fence or knock on my door or, or whatever. I was over in home hardware one day and I saw this lighthouse and I thought, wow, that is just exactly the metaphor of my life. I want to be known as a lighthouse so that when people are in their sinkhole experiences, that I'm willing to climb down into that sinkhole and walk with them. Every night when it gets dark, this is a little solar device. It's actually not working real right, well right now or I would dim the light so you could see. But when it gets dark, that light comes on and the strobe light goes all night long. I was talking to my next door neighbors the other day. They've got small children. And they've got an upstairs window. And they said, Larry, we love your, your, your lighthouse there. Our kids, before they go to bed now, they say, can we go see Larry's lighthouse at work? And they'll look out the window to see this strobe light going round and round. But I love it when people say, why a lighthouse? And then I say to them, well, God has given me a bit of a mission in life. 
And that is to look out for people that have big problems. I want to be like that lighthouse. What's a lighthouse for? I don't know that you've got the same fascination with them as I do, but uh, I like to be near the ocean. And I love to see those lighthouses because I know that in them is a safety, is a security that all of those who are seagoing, uh, on seagoing vessels can look to to make sure that they don't end up on the rocks. I love lighthouses. You see, our love penetrates the storms of life with hope. Often someone will come into my office and I'll say to them, don't know whether I can fix your addiction problem. I don't know whether I can uh, fix uh, your mental health issue. But I can promise you one thing. I can offer you hope. Because God is a God of hope. And he says, bring all your problems to me. Big, small, middle of the line problems, whatever they would be and I will take them and carry them for you. But I believe that God wants us to be lighthouses that reflect the light of Jesus through his people. He wants us to be people that other people who maybe haven't even established their relationship in the family of God, and they can say, that person's different. They've got something. They're so positive. They're so secure. What is it that's different? I always say, that's the beacon of the light that is shining in the dark world that we live in. As we close this morning, may I leave you with a challenge? Well, actually, two challenges. If you're going through real hard problems, and you're saying, God brought me here this morning because I'm going through a sinkhole experience, would you please feel free to come forward after the service because we want to pray with you. We want to be one of those lighthouses or maybe a group of us, a group of lighthouses that reach out to you in your pain, in your sorrow, in your loss, in your defeated state of mind, whatever it would be. We want God to help you as you work through that. My brothers and sisters counted all joy when trials and temptations come your way because God's perfect plan is to make you perfect and mature, lacking in nothing. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that we can approach your throne this morning. We can bring all of our problems and lay them at your feet. You are such a good compassionate God and we love you because we know that when we run into those sinkholes that you don't look over the edge and say sink or swim you are there to say I'm going to help you out of that sinkhole but in that process I'm going to help you to grow Lord I think of that little chorus we used to sing in Sunday school when I was a boy if all were easy if all were bright where would the cross be Where would the fight? But in the hard times, God chooses to do blessings that nothing would happen unless he was there. Oh God, thank you that we can take all of those things and leave it with you today. If someone is here this morning, God, would you move in their heart? Give them a new hope this morning. And then, Lord, give all of us that same urge and desire to reach out and help those who need our help so that we can be lighthouses in this dark world that we live in. We pray all of this in your wonderful and precious name. Amen.